rather, rather recent trend in the scholarly study of medieval violence and fighting practices. Um, it is the trend to reconstruct medieval body techniques of combat based on the study of technical liter literature of the 14th and 15th century. These so-called fight books are usually studied by what can be called scholarly practitioners, that is, academics who are also involved in the recreation of fighting techniques with replicas of medieval weaponry. These approaches show benefit of this setup as it involves bodily experiences and a practical understanding of the research subject. A very good example is the PhD thesis of Daniel Jacquet and a recently, recently published volume edited by Jacquet and Nicolas Baptiste, which is entitled Experimenté le maniement des armes à la fin du Moyen Âge. However, historical studies conducted by what I will polemically call enthusiasts and amateurs, among whom I must be counted myself, also contain various pitfalls. Some of these pitfalls are rather obvious and easy to spot, others are more subtle. The most obvious bias is an affirmative and or apologetic perspective towards the research uh, subject of study. Medieval chivalry and fighting systems, medieval knights and fencing masters <coughs> are simply seen as a good thing. The fact that these knights were first of all pre-modern white male violence professionals, they exacted force upon weaker members of the society, is simply ignored. What we see instead is some sort of idealization and identification when modern HEMA practitioners express their link to an imagined past in terms like this, I would like to quote Axel Patterson, a well-known HEMA tournament fighter, yet no academic scholar. He said on a TV report broadcasted on Al Jazeera, the 4th of November 2014, I quote, It's also the link to my heritage, to my roots. When I fight and I manage to perform a technique that no one has seen in 500 years, I feel a link to my culture, <coughs> to the men and women who fought before me. And that has a huge appeal. It helps me give perspective on life." End of quote. A young man from Sweden sees his cultural heritage in the recreation <coughs> of body techniques that are mainly described in Italian and German fencing treatises. Now, that's what I call the strong European version of an invented tradition. <laughs> this statement marks an important feature of HEMA studies and discourses. It is this affirmative and identifying perspective that leads us to what HEMA actually is a very modern practice of swordplay, which is legitimized by linking it to medieval documents. I personally think that the phenomenon of HEMA is at the very heart of discourses on the epistemological status of history itself. History or historical sciences can be seen as the contemporary practice of telling well-founded stories about the past. History as social practice is thus creating its own subject of study by forming narratives about the past and loading them with meaning for today's, today's societies. In the case of HEMA, there are yet some differences compared to intellectual or political history. HEMA researchers are addressing bodily practices, <coughs> and they often try to understand and reproduce them with their own bodies. This contribution will thus be organized around the notion of technique. Following Dan Spatz, I understand this term in the following manner. Technique differs from related concepts like performativity and habitus in that it emphasizes the <coughs> epistemic dimension of practice. And body technique then refers to transmissible and repeatable knowledge of relatively reliable possibilities afforded by human embodiment. End of quote. My paper will thus have a rather strong theoretical part, and it will be organized by the following questions. What is technique and how is, is it related to practice? How is technique acquired and transmitted? How can technique be recorded? And finally, how can historical records of technique be understood, interpreted, and converted into practice? Or, to reformulate the question in a more concrete manner, how do we get from this to that, and what happens on the way? My aim today is to mark certain limits of understanding in HEMA studies, and to discard the claim of historical authenticity, which is still explicitly or implicitly linked with the undertaken attempts to recreate, to recreate body techniques of the past. I shall start with my first question. What is technique and how is it related to practice? If we are addressing fight books as traces of a past culture of body movements, one of the best suiting concepts seems to be what the French sociologist Marcel Mauss labeled techniques of the body. <coughs> 
In an article first published in 1935, Moore defines this term as, I quote, the ways in which from society to society, men know how to use their bodies, end of quote. Many authors have worked with this observation since then. One of the latest is the already cited Ben Spatz, who recently published a study on embodied technique as knowledge. Technique is here defined as the knowledge content of specific practices. According to Spatz, the term practice refers only to concrete, you could also say historical instances of actions, that are defined by the acting person, the time, and the location of the action. Moments of pra practice are thus unique and not repeatable. An example he gives for practice is his swimming on a given day, his swimming in a given year, and the swimming in North America in the 20th century. All these practices are structured, yet not determined by technique. In the case of swimming, the front crawl as a specific swimming stroke that became popular in Western competitions around the end of the 19th century um, can be seen as an example of technique among many others. Technique thus refers to the knowledge content of a given practice. In contrast to practice, technique is repeatable in varying situations and contexts. And as knowledge, it is not innate, but socially acquired. Technique is thus not ahistorical, as Spatz notes, but transhistorical. It spreads from body to body and from society to society. Therefore, its status is always hybrid and mixed, because new technique always encounters already embodied older technique. Among many important aspects of the book, I shall highlight another two, which will be of importance at the end of my presentation. First, social cultural identities are essentially structured by technique. What we do and how we do it is therefore at the heart of all inactions of race, class, and gender. And second, technique transforms the body. It structures not only concrete instances of actions, but through embodiment, it also alters the physical structure of the body. I quote, in these examples, the physical body itself is transformed by the practice of technique over time, so that the range of what a given body can do is substantially altered. It is therefore no exaggeration to say that different kinds of technique produce different bodies in a literal as well as in a metaphorical sense. The plasticity of embodiment, the degree to which it can be shaped by technique, is not unlimited. But to whatever extent the anatomy of the body is shaped through technique, physiology can be understood as a form of sedimented agency." End of quote. <coughs> to what movement a given body is capable and how a person reacts is thus depending on the social techniques practiced in a specific region and at a specific moment of history. With this definition of technique and practice, we shall now turn to the question how technique is transmitted and how research on embodied technique is related to other fields of history. By looking at body techniques of the past and by qualifying technique as knowledge, we have entered the realm of new cultural history with its knowledge-oriented definition of culture. I therefore argue that fighting techniques are to be seen as part of a historical culture of fighting. A culture of fighting comprises the contemporary discourses, norms, and symbolic orders that organize the subjective realities of the fighters and thus enable and restrict their action. <coughs> within, this, sorry, within this framework, the dialectic interaction between technique and practice takes place. Technique structuring practice and practice reproducing, adapting, and thus altering technique. A transmission of technique can take place in a situation of implicit or explicit learning. At a basic level, fighters of the past were socialized <coughs> in certain ways of using their bodies in combat. So if we try to conceptualize the transmission of fighting skills, we are first of all dealing with processes of implicit learning by observation and imitation. For this type of learning, concepts and specialized terms are not necessary. The only thing that matters is skill and personal contact to other skilled people. However, with the fight books, we have the surviving traces of explicit learning and education. Experienced fighters or professional instructors condensed their skills into certain concepts of how techniques of the body work and made attempts to describe these concepts within the fight books. We thus have evidence of a specialized technical language, like in the oldest known fight book, written at the beginning of the 14th century and conserved here in Leeds at the Royal Armouries. The famous manuscript 133 contains depictions of fighting techniques and descriptions in Latin. 
Furthermore, technical terms in medieval German are inserted to denom denominate specific techniques like the fiddle bow, <coughs> the crutch, or the half shield. This indicates that the vernacular denominations of the, of the described fighting techniques were already used and widespread when they were documented for the first time in a written account. If we now look at the semiotic relations between denominations or depictions of technique, didactic concepts of technique, and the actual fighting practice, we see that the basic pattern is the semiotic triangle. The symbol evokes the thought, the thought refers to an object, and the object is in mutual relation with the symbol. The singular instances of a heterogeneous fighting practice can thus be seen as real types, while a didactic concept of technique represents a form of um, a rebarian ideal type. The concept refers to a form of autopraxis, a right and good way to do something. Returning to the question how technique is transmitted from one individual to another, we can see that these instances of practice belong to the domain of subjective skill, while concepts of how techniques work and the symbols, symbols evoking these concepts are part of an intersubjective communication about subjective skills. In his striking, striking theoretical approach towards technique, Ben Spatz does not address a problem that lies at the heart of any historical perspective, of any historical perspective, sorry. Practice is fleeting and not repeatable. Technique is transmissible and travels through time and space. But it is the very nature of technique as a form of knowledge to be transformed in this process. To do historical research on embodied technique, we are thus depending on cultural, cultural artifacts of a given period that can be interpreted as traces of past practices structured by technique. An important question is therefore how technique can be recorded by the use of different media before the invention of celluloid film. Linked with it is the hermeneutic problem of how to understand these media and read them as traces of past technique. I tried to show the difference between subjective practice on the one hand, structured by technique, and an active communication about subjective skills. In a face-to-face -face situation of instruction, this subjective skill can be translated into a description of how technique works. This description can be accompanied by demonstration and a correction of the movements of the, of the apprentice's movements. In the fight books, we have yet only the surviving relics of this communication process. Left over are only textual descriptions of technique accompanied by single or sometimes serial depictions of crucial moments in the execution of a technique. Following the works of Michael Polanyi, we yet have to distinguish between explicit and implicit knowledge. The embodied techniques of competent fighters and instructors thus represent, represent a form of passive knowing that is bound to personal experience and cannot be fully verbalized as a form of explicit knowledge. I quote, rules of an art can be useful, but they do not determine the practice of an art. They are maxims which can serve as a guide to an art only if they can be integrated into practical knowledge of the art. They cannot replace this knowledge. An art which, ca which cannot be specified in detail cannot be transmitted by prescription, since no prescription for it exists. It can be passed on only by example from master to apprentice. This restricts the range of diffusion to that of personal context. End of quote. Thus, by the attempt to record fighting techniques, by the use of any medium, the most important part of the actual knowledge is lost. This observation leads us to the last question. How can historical records of technique be understood, interpreted, and converted into practice? We face the problem that the practice technique cycle vanished with the living medieval population. no longer exists. The surviving fight books contain symbols for complex techniques of the body. But what <coughs> the fight books do not or only partially contain are the concepts behind the reference technique. Sometimes the authors try to describe these concepts. But without the relation to practice, as Polanyi points out, these concepts mostly remain cryptic and undetermined. The most important part of medieval technique as knowledge is thus lost forever. It died with its practitioners, and the fight books are only fossil remains 
like the bones of a dinosaur converted from living organic tissue into a, min in the, into a mineralized trace of the once living structure. If we want to make this dinosaur walk again, we depend on working assumptions developed on the observation of living creatures. According to the basic structure of the hermeneutic circle, as the philosopher Jean Gaudin reminds us, there is no such thing as an understanding without presuppositions. In relation to the fight books, this means that our modern, modern fighting culture sets the stage for any interpretation which is always based on modern technique and modern practice. If we try to interpret the symbols and descriptions of the fight books um, as references to past technique, this is only possible on the basis of modern technique. This leads us directly to the question, if modern attempts to recreate medieval te fighting techniques are to be seen as purely modern constructions or as authentic reconstructions. The supporters of the authenticity claim usually point out the similarities between HEMA and experimental archaeology. There are yet essential differences between these two approaches. Experimental archaeology is mainly concerned with artifact production and use. If we compare the setup to a mathematical equation, we have the constant properties of the used materials and the human practice as an unknown that led to a given surviving artifact. The same structure is applicable for the reconstruction of wear marks on artifacts. However, in the case of HEMA, we are confronted with a reciprocal phenomenon of reaction that involves mind and body of socialized practitioners. Fighting techniques don't just follow a paradigm of pure ahistorical functionalism. The simple question how a specific technique works is therefore highly underdetermined. Furthermore, as fighting is a contingent phenomenon of reciprocity, and as the medieval counterpart is already dead for centuries, the results of modern reconstructions can only be tested <coughs> in a modern context against other modern practitioners and their socialized bodies. The recreation of fighting techniques thus remains an equation with more than two unknowns. In the end, these equations cannot be solved. Instead of relating HEMA to experimental archaeology, a comparison with medieval musicology would be more suitable. While fighting is a phenomenon of reaction, music is a phenomenon of reception that is also based on, uh, also depending on a socialized counterpart. Furthermore, the attempts to recreate the sound of lost music through the study of medieval notation systems already began at the end of the 19th century. Like in HEMA, a movement of musical performers emerged that used replicas or even original instruments to interpret the early and incomplete notation systems in order to recreate the sound of medieval music. This so-called historical performance movement dominated the discourse on the sound of medieval music for quite a long time. However, in the 1980s, the debate on the statues of these reconstructions began with the articles of Richard Taruski. It reached its peak and also, as far as I know, its conclusion between 2002 and 2004 with the three monographs of Daniel Leach Wilkinson, Annette kreuziger Herr, and John Butt. I would like to go into detail here, but my time is limited. <laughs> I will therefore only refer, and I have a Swiss officer. <laughs> um, I will only re refer to the end of the debate by quoting Annette Kreuziger Herr. I quote in translation, At the beginning of the 21st century, no one still dares to speak of historical authenticity. End of quote. Also, no one speaks of historical performance anymore. Instead, the musicians interpreting medieval traces of music are using the more modest term historically informed performance. The reasons are very similar to the aspects I tried to highlight in my presentation. My argument is that fighting as a human practice structured by techniques is not ruled by anachronistic and ahistorical functionalism, functionalism. If we take into account the valuable scientific approaches towards embodiment, then we have to historicize the, the human body and its behavior in common. Functional aspects are a basic component of fighting systems as social knowledge. 
But the phenomenon is very more complex and thus worth to be studied from a perspective of social history. To conclude, I would therefore like to quote Daniel Leach Wilkinson. I quote, almost everything we might wish to know about the sound of medieval music is lost to us. Without living in the Middle Ages and experiencing that culture, we are never going to be able to make this sense of those fragments of evidence that was made of them when they were set down. Even the things we recognize that people set texts, sang and played instruments can have no reality in sound, except in so far as we can imagine them in relation to the way people sing and play around the world today. Ways of singing and ways of playing change too fast for us to be able to get backwards. If we replace music with fighting systems and the sound of medieval music with the execution of technique, we might be able to save a lot of time in HEMA studies. Thank you. <laughs>